organic creature and teach that lives in this country today and maybe the, the least known relative to his massive level of skill. Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglas Ames. It's an honor uh, to be presented by him. Uh, I am overwhelmed uh, by his love and appreciate the honor of sharing with you uh, every year. And what he's done, along with uh, my beloved sister Linda Clemens, is that they have used this time to bring out of me a lot of stuff I didn't know I had. And, and I'll give you this example. This very workshop, forced me to interrogate what it is I do. Uh, basically, I didn't get up and do it, uh, work at it, but I've never spent time investigating, interrogating how I do what I do. And so uh, I want to thank you for that, because this has been one of the most exciting uh, episodes of my own experience, because I got a chance to really say, OK, so why do you do that? And really question you know, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and uh, revising what I do uh, if it didn't seem to make sense. And so I really want to thank uh, George for that. I want to compliment him one more time uh, with something that was said about me that I feel I got from him. Um, last week I hosted a conference and afterwards one of our guests made this statement. He said, uh, man, I just love preaching here because you created the kind of church where it's safe to be black. Mm -hmm. That's good. Very interesting, because there are not many spaces in this country where it's safe to be black. And of course, when it's safe to be black, it's not dangerous for others. It's, it's like, hey, if it's safe for us, you know it's safe. <laughs> and, and, and it just hit me as he said that, that's what I get when I go to Power Network. A safe space, not just to be black, but to be black and excellent. And I think we ought to thank God that we are Now, here's the, this is the flow for today. I'm going to drop some principles on you that I hope will be helpful. And then, based on a phenomenal presentation I heard yesterday, uh, were any of you in yesterday when Linda Clemens made her presentation, her master? Yeah. Oh my God. So, uh, I heard her a lot. Yeah. Uh, but yesterday was electric. It was bananas. And so I'm going to take uh, at the end of our time together what she did at the end of her presentation and we're going to develop together a speech of empowerment and transformation. Because she did something at the end that, as a matter of fact, and I was telling her, telling her last night, George, that I came in and she's already up and someone greeted me at the door and said, your girl is in rare form today. And so I said, uh-oh. And uh, because I know what rare form is like for LC. And that's why I have to call her now LC because it's dangerous to say her name. Uh, you were there yesterday. You cannot say Linda without losing power. Uh, so I'm not, I, 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 I just say LC, but I keep it safe by saying LC. Uh, but, but at the end, what we're going to do, she did something so powerful that I literally 
I came into the session, I was standing along the wall, and I kept moving to get closer and closer because she was just killing it. And so I said, at the, and so at the end, I have all this stuff in my mind about, I'm going to preach this immediately, but I can't be bothered. So I rushed out, I'm sure I didn't speak to people, and went to my room, and I just downloaded what I learned from LC. And so what George is doing is forcing me, because as I was doing that, I'm saying, this is what I do. And so that's what I want to share. It's, and and I, don't, I don't think I'm all that great. I just think God is good and has given me a gift. And I want to kind of pass on uh, as, the, as, the, as the workshop thing says, uh, some secrets, uh, blueprint as it were, for uh, public speaking that is <coughs> transformational and empowering. I begin with this, and it's a testimony. This statement was made to me. Uh, in my homiletics class by Dr. John D. Mangrum, uh, Homiletics, the Science and Art of Preaching. Dr. Mangrum makes this statement, I'm a student uh, in my, what, sophomore year at now defunct but never dead HBCU <laughs> College, and Dr. Mangrum makes this statement, he says, after I had finished my sermonic presentation, he said, that was 20 minutes of my life I'll never get back. You just wasted 20 minutes of my life because you have the nerve to come to my class ill-prepared and you never connected with me. And that for me has haunted me from day one. I never ever want to stand up before an audience, a congregation. I never want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone uh, in a counseling context or who is, who, who, who is seeking my coaching advice. I never want to have them say of me, I was ill-prepared and I never made a connection. I think that right there, those are the two worst things that can happen if you are engaged in public speaking, if you are engaged in oratory, you don't make a connection and you come ill-prepared. And it just blew me away to unpack that because what? A connection is something that gives power, per se, to your phone, for example. If your phone is disconnected, it cannot fulfill its purpose. Therefore, if your speech, if your oration does not connect with the audience, what happens? You do not have the power to fulfill the purpose for which both of you or all of you have gathered together. And so on the one level, there's disconnection I experienced, but then on the other level, and this was jacked up, I just really wasn't ready. And I made up my mind from that point forward, whenever I am getting ready to speak, the one thing I'm going to be guilty of is over-preparing. And so even though George said I did that last year, I studied the Power Networking Conference. And so as a consequence, I came ready to go whatever, whatever direction I had to go in, because if George said go in this direction, that direction, I had studied the conference so much. I was so aware of what the general theme of the conference was. I had listened to George every time he got up to speak. And I'm downloading everything he's saying because I know George may receive a flash, revelation, inspiration, and lean over and say, this is your thing for this particular session right here. And I'm like, boom, let's roll with it. Why? Because I studied everything that is going going on about it. Michael Jordan made this statement. Michael Jordan says he never was afraid during a game to take a shot because he had spent so much time in the gym preparing that preparation was his immunization shot against fear. And I love that because whatever else happens when we find ourselves, what, in a situation where we are speaking publicly, Nerves can become unglued. And what Jordan says, if you are prepared, that's your immunization shot. Fear can't hang out with you when you're already ready. And so I made up my mind, no matter what the setting is, even if it's extemporaneous, don't miss this, even if it's what Jay-Z does, Jay-Z can literally 
go into the recording studio and boom, just start going. Nothing in front of him. And so my thing is, Jay has a gift, no doubt about it. But Jay is also prepared. And my thing is, in a few weeks ago, I spoke at the uh, 100 Black Men of America National Conference down in Florida, and it was a trip because it was the week from hell for me, but I was still preparing, but I did not get a chance to type out the whole script. And so, basically, I get there, and my flight is late, and I had slept on the flight when I should have been, you know, typing everything out. And then I get to the banquet, and they say, you know you're on next. And so I said, no, uh, you want to give me a little more time? No, we just got here. We've been waiting on you. And so they introduced me. I had to get up, and again, off the cuff, I had to go for it. But the thing is, I had been reading, studying, downloading, and so I stood there, and in that moment, I was able to organize thoughts, organize a thing, and just basically do a Jay-Z, and that is go with the flow. And the powerful thing is that I'm still hearing about that message, and it was a message to kids. One of the hardest groups to reach. It was not an adult group that just came hungry for it. This was a group that was saying, listen, uh, one cat said to me afterwards, usually I, I, I take my nap during uh, speeches, uh, but man, I can do it all the time. And I'm tripping because I know I had not typed that speech out. I wish I had typed it out now because I can't repeat it because I didn't type it out. Uh, but the bottom line is I learned early the importance of preparation, preparation, preparation. So I'm going to kind of hang with that theme for the, for the majority of this session. Uh, and that is just deal with this concept of preparation, how do I prepare, and I'll especially deal with this piece about how do you do this thing, again, without notes in front of you. That's important to me, and I drop this on you because I learned how to do this accidentally, providentially, whatever, whatever one you want to use. George, I was uh, supposed to preach, it was my second year of preaching, I was 19 years old, and I was supposed to preach in Fresno, California, I grew up, I was living in San Francisco, and so I drove to Fresno, and it's time, it, 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 it's a worship service, and in the black church back then, Amazing Grace was sung right before you got up to preach. So they're singing Amazing Grace. I have typed out my sermon, script, eight by 11 sheet, put it in my uh, jacket <coughs> pocket. I thought, reach for it, it's not there. I'm panicking as they go to verse two. And I said, okay, it's not here, it's not here, it's nowhere on me, and I'm three hours away from home. Evidently, it's home somewhere. I say, okay, well maybe it's in the car. And so I send someone to the car, but now we're on verse four. And uh, I say, please sing one more verse. There's one more verse in there that we never ever sing. Please sing that fifth verse. And, 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 and maybe I'll be all right. And so uh, my boy gets to the door and says, it ain't in the car. And so I said, oh my God. Now, I didn't say that. I used some other language. Don't judge me. Uh, uh, I did speak in an unknown tongue. <laughs> that wasn't going to help because, you know, cussing and preaching just don't work. At the no, same no, time, no. You know, unless you have a young blood. So, so I, uh, <laughs> so I, uh, so I said, okay, okay, God, we're going to have to go with it. So I got up and delivered it. And it was a trip because when I went to look at the script afterwards, I missed two sentences. Wow. And that's when it hit me that I was standing, I was literally reading my script on the screen of my mind. And so that's when it hit me, okay, this is a gift of what? A photographic memory, as George has stated. So I have that, but I want to hasten to say this. For years, I depended on that until something went wrong one day, and that is uh, I'm getting older and my eyes don't see as clear as they used to. I'm reading the screen and I can't see a word. I miss the second word, the third word, and I panic. And I panic in front of the audience and didn't even know how to, pick, uh, how, how to get myself back together because I missed three words. And that's when George referred to him, Gardner C. Taylor, rescued me. Gardner C. Taylor, I'm reading an interview, and he made this statement, and I give it to you, and please, please take this uh, and be blessed by it. Dr. Taylor 
Again, spoke every message without notes. That's one of the people who inspired me to do that, uh, along with my uh, episode in Fresno. Dr. Taylor made this thing. He says, I do not memorize sermons. I internalize sermons. That's good. Yes. That blew my mind. He said, I don't memorize. I internalize. I know the message so that even if I miss a word here or there, I go with the flow of what I know. Now, here's, here's, what, here's what I've done to kind of uh, Haynesize it and, and Freddie Haynes remix it. So, so I internalize, but at the same time, I recognize that every message I'm trying to convey, there's an end game. There's a goal. And I've got to take a journey to get to that goal. And so I set up signposts along the way. And the signposts along the way help me to get from point A to point C. Okay, and, I, and I'll, I'll unpack that in just a moment. Uh, I'll give you this example. George gave me, gave me notice this year, gave me a theme, and, and the theme that just jumped out at me, it had to do with what? Wakanda. And so, can Frazier Net be the next, uh, can Frazier Net become Wakanda? If not now, when and with whom? Okay, that's the theme. So what do I do? I've already seen, what? Uh, Black Panther four times. I watch it four more times. And then I read everything there is on Wakanda that has been printed from uh, Ryan Coogler and his assessment to uh, some others. I, I, I went and reread all of the Black Panther uh, comic strip series. I did all of that in preparation. Why? Because when I get up, I already have an end goal in mind. I already have that down. But I've read so much on Wakanda that if I forget anything while I'm speaking, you won't know it because I can immediately download something I've already read. And so preparation basically says, whatever I say when I get up there today, you won't even know what's in the original script because if I get away from it, cool. I've read enough on Wakanda to, to, to create my own Wakanda, okay? And I guess that's the main thing I, I, I want to, again, emphasize. Preparation, knowing the content, not memorizing the content, but knowing, wow. being intimate with the content. So much so, now we'll say this, I do memorize what? Rap songs, poetry, quotes. That will be memorized. But the rest of it is basically knowing it and then flowing with what I know with my eyes on the prize. And again, checking out the signpost along the way, such as illustrations, such as the point I want to make right here, that if I don't make this point, I cannot get where I'm trying to go uh, by way of the, uh, uh, of, of the North Star I'm driving toward. So I think that's just very important. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Uh, the next thing I'll emphasize is, okay, what's the process? What's the process? For me, the process, and again, George, I mean, you, you, you've been, uh, you, you brought out all my, all my heroes. Uh, Samuel DeWitt Proctor came up with uh, something that I go by every time I'm crafting what I'm trying to uh, deliver. He borrows from Hegel, uh, George Friedrich Hegel, and, and he calls it his Hegelian homiletic. And I love it. The Hegelian homiletic goes like this. When I'm crafting a message, I begin with the antithesis, I shift to the thesis, and then I wrap it with the synthesis. Here it is. The antithesis is what Dr. Proctor called the real. What's real, the situation in life, what's real, what people actually are dealing with, how they're feeling, where they are. And so every message I start out, I basically open up with a question, I'll open up with, uh, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me just do uh, LC's piece right quick. <laughs> so uh, yesterday, uh, Linda, just she just lost it. She just lost it. So Linda has some brothers up on stage, and you know they rush up there. I say, oh, God, they in trouble. They don't even know <laughs> who they're dealing with. This ain't the one. And, uh, but I just enjoyed it. And so they get up there, and so watch what happens. So LC uh, says, OK, I want you to say your name, but before that, Strong black man. Powerful, 
powerful moment. It, it was absolutely awesome. And, and again, I'm not going to unpack it too much because we'll get to that later on. But what is it saying for a black man in this day and age to stand up before an audience and unashamedly affirm who they are? I'm a strong black man. She didn't even stop there. She said, now say your name. Say your name. And hold your arm out. And then she tried to take the arm down. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Strength as long as he said and knew his name. All right? But then she came. <laughs> you see? We're going to pray for her, okay? She said, I want you to say my name. <laughs> say it three times. Linda. Linda. And then the third time, say, Linda. <laughs> and by now, I'm along the wall dying. <laughs> I want to say, this can't be my sister doing this, these poor men. And, 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 and so she says, say, 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 say my name, say my name, Linda. <laughs> no strength, no power whatsoever. Let's, let's, let's just deal with that. Let's, yeah, let, let, let's roll with that right now. Uh, uh, as long as they said their name, power. When they said her name, weak. Let's, let, let's, let's just derive some principles from that. Okay, I'll, I'll start it. I'll start it. And then I, and then I want to hear from you, okay? Uh, Wakanda in Black Panther. Classic saying. We didn't even discuss this last night, LC. No, I'll, I'll do, I'll do uh, Famous Amos first. Yes. Famous Amos. Famous Amos. Now, if you, I'm, I'm old school, you don't know about Famous Amos. Famous Amos chocolate chip cookies. Absolutely amazing. Famous Amos sold. So, yeah. sold, sold, his, sold his company and somebody else got it. And now he's trying, to, of course he tried to come back, but they took his name. And it's never been the same because they took his name. Power in name. I'll give you another one. Tina Turner. Tina Turner. You saw what's love got to do, got to do, got to do with it? Tina Turner uh, says, I go. I'm done with you. I don't want nothing from you, but the one thing you can't have is my name. And Tina exploded. After Ike, because she kept her name. She recognized this power in the name. I'll give you one more, one more. Wakanda, Wakanda. Classic scene for me. Before my man, uh, T'Challa, can become the king of Wakanda, he has to experience a challenge. Mm. I can preach that right there. Because you can't get to any throne mm. without a challenge. And so, so he gets... He, he, he has the challenge come from who? M'Baku. Mm -hmm. M'Baku comes from what? The hills. And M'Baku comes, and M'Baku is whooping T'Challa's behind. Yes. I mean, and, and then stabs him with the spear. T'Challa catches it right here, and he's leaning over what? That waterfall. And his mother, the regal yes. Angela Bassett, says, show them who you are. Mm. And when she said, show them who you are, something got into him, and he said, I am T'Challa, son of T'Chaka. And that's when the match turned. Because he said his name. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. So, 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 let's unpack that. If, if, if you're up speaking, and, and, and I guess I should say to be fair, the, the, the other gift I've been blessed with is, uh, Dr. Harry S. Wright, mentor at Bishop College, told me to always wear my homiletical eyeglasses. Always make sure I'm moving through life, seeing truth, the truth of God, in experiences uh, while reading. Uh, just look for truth and watch God illustrate and illuminate an idea as you are reading. Example. Uh, I'm reading uh, USA Today several weeks ago, and they shocked me because in Florida, outside of Miami, there is a, um, a shelter, a hurricane shelter, that they're having to uh, demolish 
because of termites. And they said the hurricane shelter had been up for about 30 years and survived Andrew, Katrina, uh, and several other major named hurricanes. But the hurricane shelter was having to be demolished because of termites. It survived Katrina, <laughs> it survived Andrew, but it can't survive termites. Mm. Mm. Harry S. Wright said, as you're reading, as you're having experiences, see truth in all of that. Do you see the truth in that? How a lot of us are strong enough to withstand a major crisis, but it's the small stuff that can eat away at you and you didn't even know it was happening until all of a sudden everything that you had built up is about to crumble, not because of the major hurricane, but because of the small stuff. And a lot of us can't handle, watch this, life moving forward because the small stuff has eaten away at us. Okay? So, so let's get back now to our girl, L.C. <laughs> Taking brother's power. L.C., I told you you messed me up yesterday, okay? You messed me up. Huh? Oh, Kunta! Kunta! Thank you, thank you, thank you. How did, how did the enslavers, my man, how you doing, Doc? I was looking for you. I was looking for you. You know, I got, I got it. I'm sorry. I, 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 I know you are. I know you are. So listen, so Kunta Kente, Asa Hilliard, who's been here, Asa Hilliard said in the slave making process, the first thing you do after you rip someone from their family, this country's good at that. Uh, after you do that, what? You change who they are. Change their name. Kunta Kente loses, watch this, his power, his liberating runaway spirit when, they, when, when, when they, they, they've given him the name Toby, but he's refused it and kept running, kept running, kept running. Finally, they, cut his, uh, fi finally they what? They beat him and they beat him. They cut his foot and they finally make him say, say, say what's your name? And he finally says, Toby, power gone, because he's given up his name. Now, let's unpack that. What, 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 what was the message yesterday from L.C.? I told you I can't call her Linda. What was the message yesterday from L.C. when those brothers said their name, their name, and she could not move the arm. But when they said her name, arm goes down. How would you develop a message out of that? Power and truth. Who? Who said that? Power, said that. Power in truth. In truth. In truth. Truth sets you free. Mm. If the truth sets you free, let, let's develop that. A lie will lock you up. Mm. If a lie will lock you up, and LC made the brothers say her name, lose strength, uh, then evidently, I'm gonna develop this thing now, thank you. Evidently, that means that I'm giving my power to someone else, appropriating their name into my spirit, and when I appropriate their name into my spirit, I lose all power. And as long as I'm saying my name, I got power. I got strength. And, 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 and what I want to say to us, thank God, George Frazier, Power Networking Conference, they keep making black folks say our name. Yeah. Unapologetically, unashamedly, we say our names here. When we say our names here, we can hold up our arms in strength. But when you leave here and stop saying your name, yeah. And, and, and so, so, so I like true. That. I like that. Someone else, another principle from that, just from that. You can't set you free until you identify the lie you keep telling yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All, right. All right. And so you can't be set free until you stop telling yourself the lie. Because if, if, if you tell yourself a lie, it's, it's like what, ham bone. See, again, this thing is, is again, this is all prior reading, ham bone. Be what you is and not what you ain't, because if you ain't what you is, you is what you ain't. <laughs> so, so, so you lying to yourself. No strength. 
Anyone else? What you saw? Yes, ma'am. You can't have power if you're not being who you truly are. Uh, uh, the Egyptian concept of what? Uh, uh, uh. Well, Shakespeare to thine own self be true, and it was follow as the night and day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. I like that. But, but the Egyptians talk about the power of identity in what? Know thyself. The Egyptian dictum, know thyself. Know thyself. If I know myself, then guess what? You can try to beat my arm all you want to, but I'm saying my name, Frederick Douglass Haynes III. I'm saying my name, and saying my name means certain things to me. Frederick. Oh, I like that. In the German, it's what? Peaceful warrior. That means I will fight you in the name of peace. And because my name is Frederick. Frederick Douglass, named for the silver tongue orator of the abolitionist movement. That simply means I've got to fight for my peace. Frederick Douglass Haynes, that's after my daddy and granddaddy, because I'm Frederick Douglass Haynes the third one. As long as I'm saying my name and living in the power of my name, because I know who I am. Thank you for that. It's identity that feeds my sense of possibility and keeps me moving in the direction of my destiny. That's from LC yesterday. I didn't write that one down. I'm going to write that down. Now, yes, sir. Huh, huh. So I say my name, meaning I am created by a creator. And if I'm saying my name, that was given to me, watch this, by my creator, because now I'm getting the metaphysical. I'm, I'm beyond just my parents naming me, but believing that even in the naming process, there was the creator that inspired my parents to give me a certain name. I'll give it to you like this. There's a brilliant theologian, biblical scholar named Cain Hope Felder. Cain, C-A-I-N, Hope. Last name Felder. His testimony is this. Linda, this is just coming to me right now. I, I said, LC, this is coming to me right now. Cain <laughs> Hope Felder, one day asked his mother when he's a teenager, he'd gone to uh, Sunday school and read how Cain killed Abel. He said, Mama, why would you name me Cain? Cain is a killer, the first killer in scripture. And his mother then proceeded to tell her son of the violence that she was subjected to while she was pregnant with him. My Lord. A victim of intimate partner violence. And, 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 and life just crumbled. But she said, son, I didn't just name you Cain. What's your middle name? Hope. Hope. So son, Understand that Cain is a reflection of a reality I was going through while I was impregnated with, while I was pregnant with you. But the good news is, son, that Cain was not the last word. Your middle name is Hope because in the midst of the hell I was catching, I still held on to Hope. And I want you to live every day of your life knowing that even when Cain is trying to mess with you, that hope is going to have the last word for you. Okay? Again, y'all helping me unpack this right here. Okay? I mean, you're giving me stuff. I, I hope we're recording this because I'm, I'm going to preach this. I promise you. Yes, sir. <laughs> the body recognized the truth. Say again. Your body recognized the truth. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. No, you did not go there. Did y'all hear what she said? Your body recognizes truth. That means your body knows when there's something or someone in its face that contradicts truth. Ooh, where are you from? From Paris, France. Get on out of here. You are you, you something else. You dangerous. I'm going to watch you. Okay, I, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, unpack that. Think about that. How many of us have been, I mean, before I had my wonderful wife, Deb, it, it just seems to me now, my body was saying, you know what, they was a lie. Mm -hmm. right. You hanging with someone, you're dating, you're, 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 you're getting with someone who's alive for you. Mm -hmm. And so as a consequence, mm -hmm. yes. body even knows. Mm -hmm. Huh? Okay. Body don't lie, body don't lie. Body don't lie. 
That's what that's what she's been teaching. Body don't lie. That, that, that's why that, that's why she teaches the power of reading. Reading people by what they say. Not I mean, I, I, and, and you got me so messed up right now. I can watch television and tell when someone's lying. So when 46 minus 1 says, yes, I did that, yes, I did that, no, he did not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I mean you, you'll see him, 46 minus 1. You know, he'll say, I mean, I mean, watch him, he'll say, yes, I did, yes, I did, yes, I did. Body don't lie. Good you say, no, you didn't, while you're trying to use your lips to say, yes, you did. Good student, good student. Huh? Good <laughs> say, say, yes, ma'am. To thyself be true. Good, very good, very good. To thine own self be true. Excellent, excellent. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, 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 and, and, and again, because, because again, you're repeating the lie, repeating the lie, repeating the lie. I could really go there with what we get every day, every tweet, all the stuff we hear, and you know it ain't true. You lie, tell a lie, you didn't lie. Mm -hmm. And the country hears the lie so much, it just keeps getting weaker and weaker Come on. Come on. as each lie is told. Mm. Mm. LC! Mm. Okay, okay, who? Y'all kill me. Uh, Doc, you, you, you killed me already. Hold on. Let me, let me come to you, and then you. I'll come back to you. Say one more time. Can you stand up? Can you stand up? Say that, because the replicated copy is what? It ain't you. It's a copy. It's a fake. Okay? It's trying to be what it ain't. Okay? So the authentic you is the you you have to always aspire to. I mean, I mean, forget that replicated, you know, trying to be someone else. Uh, or, or, or someone else trying to be you ain't going to be as good as you. You know, my daughter right now is it's really funny when she hears a preacher who is mimicking me uh, or trying to emulate me, she gets ticked off. And I'm trying to tell her that's a compliment. And she can't stand it because she feels they're ripping off of me. And I'm saying, but you gotta understand that they can rip off of me all they want to, they're still not their best selves. They're not, they, they, they can't be them, their best selves as long as they're ripping off of someone else. They have to authentically find their voice. I won't forget this, I gotta give this testimony and I'll come to the next one. Uh, as, 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 as you'll know, I talk kind of fast. That is antithetical to the black preaching tradition I grew up under. Mm -hmm. To hear Gardner Taylor is to hear someone speak in a, what, uh, discipline, uh, fashion, a pace, a cadence. There's the word, there's the word. Check this out. When I was first, when I first announced my call to preach, my pastor gave me a book, and in the book it said, as a preacher, here's what you do. You go slow, rise high, strike fire, sit down in the storm. And I didn't know how to do that, because I talk fast, and so I would like a helicopter, go straight up. And uh, that, that, that bothered me, because all of my colleagues, they were, they were going slow. Rising high, striking fire. Otis Moss Jr., classic at doing that. Howard and so, Thurman. Uh, Howard Thurman, oh my God, I'm going to quote him in just a second. Uh, and so check out what happened. I'm preaching in Gary, Indiana. It's a simultaneous revival. All churches get together. And uh, so my friend Ralph West, one of the great preachers of the day, uh, he gets up, goes slow, rises high, strikes fire. Boom! The place is, is over. And I got to preach the next day, and so I, I called Ralph. I said, listen, Ralph, I need to learn how to do what you do. He said, what are you talking about, Fred? I said, I need to try to learn to go slow, rise high, strike fire, and sit down. He said, Fred, why are you going to try to talk in the pulpit unlike how you speak in one-on-one -on -one conversations? He said, you're talking fast right now. <laughs> so... Are you telling me you want to get up in the pulpit and talk one way 
while you wow. are one on one talking another way. That's not who you are. Mm -hmm. He said, your voice is to talk fast. And so I said, but Ralph, I, I want, he said, Fred, that ain't how you speak. And he said, what you're going to discover is that your style is the style that's becoming in vogue. I said, why do you say that? He said, check out the rap artists. They talk fast. <laughs> I said, you know, you're right. And from that moment on, I get up, boom, take off. <laughs> And, 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 and again, here, here's this thing where, the rap, well, this is the 80s, and so rap is, I mean, it's, it started in the 70s, but now by the 80s, you've got NWA, yo, Dre, I got something to say. I mean, you have all of that jumping off right now. Tupac is about to really hit his stride in the late 80s, early 90s, and so rap is what's up, and they're talking my pace which ain't how preachers in the black church tradition talk. But I'm discovering young folk in that generation are rushing to me, and they're feeling my cadence and my pace. And the next thing I know, it's like, okay, this is my voice. I say that to say, when you are speaking, it's essential that you recognize the wisdom of Phillips Brooks. He says it's about preaching, it's also about speaking, speaking, and that is, here it is, Preaching, speaking is truth through personality. I love that right there. It's truth, divine truth, God's truth, your truth coming through your personality, not Freddie Haynes. Because as long as you try to come through Freddie Haynes' personality, then you say in my name. But if you do it with your personality and yeah. say your name, yeah. Yeah. LC, you, I saw another hand. I saw another hand. Yes, ma'am. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, how do I even go there? Uh, 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 distractions. <laughs> I mean, how many of us? I'll, I'll, I'll just be me. I'll, I'll, t I'll, I'll talk for me. I can't talk for you. But I can testify that whenever I've been thrown off course, it's because of stuff in my ear yes, yes. saying something other than my name. And so I get distracted and thrown off course. So I love that right there. That that that's, that's like that's super good. deep, super deep. Because I'm I'm gonna show up, unpack that. Y'all y'all killing me, yes, sir. When you introduce somebody to themselves, they stand in their strength. Did y'all hear that? When you introduce someone to themselves, they stand wow. in their truth. You can't beat that. Is, is that not what we're trying to accomplish? When we coach someone, when we teach, when we speak, when we minister, we are trying to get them to stand in their truth. In because once you do that, then who gonna mess with you? You can't. They, they can't come for you. Once that happens, that's why. What Isabella Baum? I can't pronounce her last name. Uh, we don't even know that person, but we do know Sojourner Truth. Because she changed her name and then stood in that truth and had the nerve to say back then, and, and ain't I a woman? <laughs> Standing in her truth. That was, that was, that was, I saw another hand. Deb, that's my wife Deb, y'all. Hey, Deb. showed us yesterday was just the power of your authentic self. 
the power of being true to who you are because that's where your power is. Anytime you deviate from that, again, as Deb is saying, the example of getting up and acting like material is yours, that you know you didn't originate. <laughs> and you getting up there speaking, and I, and so I, I testify, since, since you all look at, looking real strange, like, what are you talking about? Uh, when I first was pastoring, and I won't forget, uh, one Sunday after church, one of the older deacons came up and said, Pastor, you really gifted, and we know you're going places, and we want to go with you, uh, but just understand that while you're speaking, uh, if you're not careful, uh, sometimes you sound like Charles Spurgeon, and then you sound like Harriman and Fosdick, and then you sound like Manuel Scott, and so you're kind of giving us a lot of different people, but you don't tell us who you're quoting. So even the audience recognized that though I was trying to act like it was mine, it was not. And so as a consequence, arm went down. Arm went down. And it went down publicly. And I got over from that moment ever getting up. If I say something, then guess what? If, it, if, if, if it's ripped from someone else, their name is attached to it, okay? Because, and, and here's the beautiful thing about public speaking. When you give credit to someone else, it lets the audience know you read. Right. Yeah. 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 If you just act like you came up with everything, then, you know, they start kind of questioning you. You know, you don't know everything. <laughs> okay, yes sir? She did a double whammy. She also um, recognized that they were men. Yeah. She's a woman. Yeah. A man can never be a woman. Yeah. And she kind of used that one. And she also the knowledge of who they were was yeah. not what she was telling them to call. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I'm not you you're on point, you're on point. And again, all of that is in play. And, and, and really, in the art of public speaking, you recognize in your audience who's there because any speaker worth his or her salt says, okay, in the audience today, I have this, I have this, I have that. And you govern yourself accordingly, to use old school black church announcement uh, <coughs> jargon, and as you govern yourself accordingly, and, I, and I'll do this, because again, y'all just give me so much stuff, I just, I hope I, hope I can remember all of this. Um, Deb and I, a few years ago, we were in San Francisco on the wharf, and I finally understood how different men and women communicate. I got it. I'm trying to look through this, you know, telescope check out, uh, I think it was Alcatraz. Deb is not looking through it, but she's talking and commentating on everything she sees. I'm looking at Alcatraz, and she said, did you see them seals right there? And did you see this? And did you see that? I'm not trying to see that. <laughs> I'm looking at Alcatraz. <laughs> she's taking in everything. I'm a man. Alcatraz is my focus. Brothers, would y'all stick with me? Don't leave me by myself right now. Because in a conversation with her, you are, and she's taking in everything. Stuff you didn't even think about and had nothing to do with the conversation. It has nothing to do with the thing because you're focused in on one thing, Alcatraz. She's all over the place. All, which is not a weakness, it's just what? That we communicate differently. Sisters can take in a whole lot, a whole lot, and will bring it all into the context of a conversation, even if it's off thing. Because for them, it is thing. It's like the difference between a man and a woman looking in a refrigerator. <laughs> I see the milk. He sees everything. Right. See, well, did you see it right down the Right, right, right. Right here. Right. They have a different 
different kind of this. Right, right. So, 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 exactly. So, so keep that in mind when you're speaking public. And then men in the audience, women in the audience, and I promise you, they're taking in different stuff. That's right. And so what I'm doing is I'm presenting, I'm not gonna, I, I mean, th this is free, because I never thought I would say this, but as I'm, as I'm preparing the message, I'm always thinking, okay, how will sisters grab this? Mm -hmm. What will brothers respond to when they get this right here? Okay, I'm always trying to do that. That's why when I study, for example, when, I, when, when I'm studying for a sermon, I always study every womanist or black feminist scholar I can find. Because I want her voice to come through, even as I'm speaking. Of course, I'm a quoter, but I want her voice and perspective to come through because they're sisters in the audience. Now, I can bring my maleness to it. That's easy. Okay? But I want to make sure that other voice is a part of it. And so what LC did yesterday, and I did it so well, and that is you had that male-female dynamic going on. And she knew how to say, on that third time, say, Linda. <laughs> I mean, to go from Linda to Linda, Linda. I mean, you're done. It's over. It's over. You know, some folk wanted a cigarette when you got through it. It was crazy. All right, all right. We got, eight, we got 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, I'm sorry. For free. For free. Did y'all get that? Yes. Give up real estate in our hearts. Matter of fact, they, they, they just start squatting. They start until it becomes theirs. Because Christ sends your name. 